Okay. And then, all right, I'm going to start us now. Okay. And now attendees will start to file in, and then we'll start here in just a minute when everyone's joined. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm not watching the numbers, Jason, so you let me know. Yeah, I think we can get started. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer New, and I'm the Associate Director of the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Iowa. Uh, welcome so much to this evening's Oberman Conversation. Um, we are looking at murals, in particular, a mural that um, kind of took root or maybe took wing, uh, give it, given its location um, last summer here in Iowa City that we're going to look at more closely. But then using that as a jumping off point to think about what purpose murals can serve and uh, public art in general. So um, this evening we are, I'm really feeling very lucky and delighted to have um, four different people with us who have all thought about this issue from different angles. So um, we'll be hearing in, in this particular order from um, Thomas Agrin, who is a painter. And Thomas serves on the advisory board of Public Space One here in Iowa City. Um, for three years, he was the director of public art for the Iowa City Downtown District. And I think of Thomas as really being at the epicenter for um, a, a huge, um, I don't know, proliferation of um, very joyful murals in our community in the last number of years. Uh, after Thomas, we'll hear from Delissa Edinburgh, and I've had the pleasure to know Delissa for a while at, when she was a graduate student at the University of Iowa, um, and she is an alum of our College of Education. Delissa is now out in Washington State, where she is on the faculty of Bellevue College um, in their Department of Cultural and Eth Ethnic Studies. She is still even across country serving um, as the education director for the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, um, which uh, lives kind of under the umbrella of Public Space One. And um, uh, Delissa was one of the core members of uh, this team that you'll hear about who worked on this Oracle's mural. Um, at uh, the kind of highest point of the ladder, if you will, in that project was, uh, is Jill Wells, who is with us tonight. And Jill is an artist based in Des Moines. Um, she was the lead painter on the Oracles project. And so she was the person at the top of the, the cherry picker um, working uh, on Burlington Street. Uh, in 2020, um, Jill was selected as one of five um, artist fellows to participate in the Iowa Creative Incubator through Mainframe Studios. And then coming to us from out in uh, New York is Tracy Malloy. And Tracy is an artist, collaborator, and social activist who creates independent um, art as well as large scale collaborative pieces. Um, she came to Iowa City a uh, number of years ago. I'm sorry, I didn't look up quite how long it was and worked with students at um, UAY to create a piece that was um, hung on the side of a building, actually the former PS1 on Dubuque Street for quite a while. Um, so Tracy's going to bring in some kind of outside view from public as far as being a public artist in another part of the country. So welcome all of you. Um, I wanted to start tonight, um, and, and we as a group uh, were able to talk and kind of plan this out a little, so it's not just me, but, but to give us some background to start with Thomas. And so Thomas, if you can just help us reflect on, um, on murals and particularly in, uh, within Iowa City and um, kick us off, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to 
start sharing those images. You can just share them as I as I talk over them. So um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna kind of do a quick little sort of very um, succinct survey of, of murals since 1974 in Iowa City. Um, there will be a lot of gaps, but I'm going to give you at least a trajectory here. Um, this wall, uh, some of you may recognize and some may not recognize. This is the side of the Iowa uh, Artisans Gallery building, which is now full of windows. Um, this is from probably 1974. This photo was, I think they're raising money to help turn this vacant lot into the People's Park. Um, and this is a mural that certainly for my time living in Iowa City, and uh, for a lot of people, they really remember a really big, colossal kind of municipal scale mural in the heart of Iowa City. You can go ahead and swap to the next image. Um, it was designed in a university class. Uh, there's a really great resources actually on the Iowa City Public Library's website all about this project and a really wonderful kind of 20 minute documentary with Donna Friedman who led that class, which is kind of a mural incubator class for university students. And she saw opportunity in this phase of urban renewal in Iowa City to, to make the city more attractive um, and and teach these classes to students. So there were a number of different projects around Iowa City. This is there's not a lot of great high resolution images of this mural, but this mural was called the Spirit of Black Hawk. That's why it, this area is called Black Hawk Mini Park. Um, the mural was designed by uh, Eric Christensen, I think was the student. And it went up in 1975 on what looked like very rickety non-OSHA compliant scaffolding. So um, the mural is no longer there. You know, I think it's actually an early lesson and that murals are temporary and can speak to a certain moment or needs of that moment. Uh, and unlike um, something in the center of a piazza or whatever, they don't tend to last forever. That's actually one of their assets, maybe. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next photo. Uh, this is another one just in trying to scrounge up some of these older photos. Uh, this is called like the, the blue mural, another one kind of from urban renewal days in Iowa City. Uh, and this one also I think was the very first project that Donna Friedman did with her class, which was painting this city, city bus. I don't know what happened to that image, but city bus, I think that they had all kinds of like poetry and calligraphy on the inside of it as well. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next one. And the next one. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a bench that I painted in Iowa City when I, when I kind of moved back here after graduate school. And it was actually for a project that I really didn't have my heart in necessarily. I was really confused about like, you're going to let everybody paint all these benches downtown. Like, are you guys out of your minds? You know, uh, fast forward a few years later, I mean, I still manage this program and everything. And I think that um, it was an early moment in a renewed interest in terms of all the kind of placemaking world, creative placemaking and stuff of using public art, using murals to spruce up things. Um, in a pretty safe way. And, and ultimately this program became a really beloved program. And also I think was an early trust builder with the city that owned these things of, can we outsource management of a public art project to the Iowa City Downtown District, which is a self-supporting municipal improvement district. And how, how's that gonna work out? Um, you can go to the next photo. And that's kind of how I had done a couple of murals in Iowa City and I got kind of gotten more involved in the management end of things. Uh, you can go to the next photo. Uh, through through that work, through participating in benchmarks as an artist, and then being brought on as staff at the downtown district to um, help lead some kind of public art program. And I had a couple feelings going into this. Um, one was that uh, there really wasn't much going on in Iowa City since 1975 in the mural land. I was really experienced with murals and there was not a very big budget. And so the nexus of those things was like, okay, I'm going to start and implement a, a mural program. And I would say that uh, Iowa City, you can go to the next photo. Um, Iowa City is a place that was very tentative about paint on walls. You can go to the next photo, just a few photos from murals through this program. Um, and I think uh, I thought pretty hard about how I'm going to manage that 
and how do I get permission from the multitudes of private property owners and tenants of buildings and whatever to do some of these projects. And one of the things that I hoped to do was to really uh, have the first round or two of mural projects be pretty safe and pretty amenable to really look to uh, walls that get a lot of damage or graffiti or parts of alleys that are really not very spruced up or whatever, you know, really kind of grody places. Um, how can we kind of use murals to help ameliorate some other goals? Um, and so uh, that was with the hope that over time, Iowa City would realize that it wasn't such a big deal to put paint on walls and to have a little bit more color. And the program was really ultimately uh, well received. And, and I think having more murals ultimately creates a space where people can say, I like this mural or I don't like this mural instead of saying, oh, I don't know about murals. So um, some of the other projects that we did that I think are a little bit of an evolution out of some of those lowest hanging fruit, not to diminish those murals. A lot of them are really well loved, but there are questions about what can we do with murals in Iowa City that would be more, more than just a mural. This project with United Action for Youth that was uh, Sayuri Sasaki Himen was the lead artist for this project, really modeled itself after elements of the Philadelphia mural program and artworks, which is a big mural program in my hometown in Cincinnati, that looks to big municipal mural projects um, as mentorship programs. And so I won't go into the details of this, but part of how it was funded was gathering together all kinds of resources that were not normally available for public art projects um, by working with youth through United Action for Youth, employing them to produce the mural. You can go to the next photo. Um, they did the mural offsite uh, and we laminated all these pieces of a material called Polytap up on the wall. So it was a really great project that allowed uh, young people to have a big voice in their own community. Um, it was a, a, a great project. Uh, you can go to the next slide here. I'm not even sure how many more I have and, and the next one. Um, one of the things that I think is a challenge about uh, the murals, and I'll, I'll wrap up here really quickly, uh, is that there's not much funding from the city. Uh, and there's most of the funding is coming from an organization that's gathering resources that can only spend it in one geographic area. And uh, so what I'm most excited about, and at this kind of overlaps a little bit with um, the Oracle's project was like, well, how do we get the city to take more leadership and ownership and dedicate more resources to these kinds of projects. What can the projects do other than spruce things up? Um, and how do we really fund projects, not through development bonuses and stuff like that, but through uh, equitable funding measures that make sure that the resources for public art are available in the broader community. I, I have this project and then one other one that are murals of mine, which I just have as examples here because I wanted to talk about why I was excited about doing them, which was that it was not to sort of spruce up an area of town that has a lot of investment, but I was really excited to do projects that were in parts of the town, expand beyond where we've been doing a lot of murals and do murals that respond to the really localized needs. So this mural had, this restaurant had a patio that due to a city project was, all the canopy was really obliterated. And uh, they looked for a mural project to help improve their patio after this infrastructure project. Next photo here is uh, Head, Start, uh, Head Start Preschool in my neighborhood that was in this really depressing uh, bunker of a building. And I did a project with the kids in that uh, facility as could be best to be done during COVID to try to make that um, uh, property uh, reflect the great things that are happening inside of it uh, for those that, that, that show up to go to school there or go to work there. That's the next photo there. Maybe. Anyway, I think that like what I've been most excited about for Iowa City is developing a space in which the community is uh, open to murals. And I really hoped that it would prime the pump or you know ready people for murals that were more challenging for the community. Uh, which was great about this oracles project i can go into maybe later um, some of the details of like how that happened within the public art advisory committee and where the money came from and what project wasn't done in order to make this project happen and all kinds of stuff but i can i can leave it there well um, actually thomas um and thank you so much um and as somebody who's lived here most of my life i i love those older photos um 
uh, as we segue toward um, Delissa talking about some of the, the research that went into that mural, could you just help um, kind of remind us of how that mural came about and, and the, the funding, the funding source behind it and um, yeah, yeah, when, where, why? Yeah, you know, I think <laughs> basically I think that that, that that I'll use the word opportunity, although that's not maybe a, a fully appropriate word or whatever, but that the, the chance to do that mural happened at a, at a good moment that there had been a lot of advocacy work that was happening and that I was helping with to increase the public art budget. That did happen and it was the, there was more money available all of a sudden and there was a uh, effort to get a mural on the side of the CenturyLink building, which for any of you that know this building, you can understand why you might want to do something with it. And uh, CenturyLink was just being really uh, uh, terrible to work with. I have them for my internet provider, so I hope they are not listening to this, but they, they were really, really making a lot of demands and offering no money. And I remember being in a public art meeting, this is probably in the spring of 2020, saying like, why are you bending over backwards to like do the, you know, the city owns all of these parking ramps that are also big and, and non-contributing, we'll say to be politically correct. Uh, and you guys hold the keys to those walls. So you can do anything on those walls and you have the money right now to do it. Uh, and so I think that the call within the community for a mural uh, that ultimately became the Oracles project um, happened at a moment where there was like this awareness of location, strategic location, and also availability of, of money without actually a lot of bureaucratic controls over how to spend or what to do with it, which made it more fluid and more liquid, uh, which was great. So um, that was kind of the, the lap that the project fell into. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll just kind of pass the baton to you, Delissa, because we already, I know, um, I had the pleasure of, of talking with you about this project and interviewing you. And so just, just kind of where, where you came in and, and Cass and, and then the next steps to making this a, a reality. Yeah, and uh, I think Thomas highlighted just the awareness of location, the money, and then I'm going to talk about the moment in time as well and how that played a part in the mural. So in summer 2020, in response to local and national reaction to the police killing of George Floyd and demands of Iowa City Freedom Riders, uh, a unanimous resolution was passed by the city of Iowa City's city council and one of the reforms included in the resolution was art and so July 2020 Dr. Lois Otter from the University of Iowa's security department approached members of the CAS to talk about the CAS and PS1 team to talk about working with the city to develop a public art piece mural that centered Black lives in Iowa City. When we came on board, uh, we initially hoped to finish the mural design by August 31st and uh, unveil the finished mural in, in October. So that meant four months of finalizing budgets and contracts, of bringing on board artists, photographers, painters, undergraduate fellows, completing the mural design, meeting with community consultants, um, we quickly realized how unrealistic this timeline was and the pressure it placed on us as a community organization that valued authentic and value authentic engagement and the space to process information before acting. And because of this and other realizations, we took a step backwards. Uh, so in December, 2020, uh, and this I'm just leading up to some of how I became involved in terms of the research. Um, in December, 2020, we, we met with members of the CAS, we, CAS PS1 Oracle team, um, attended a public art advisory committee to discuss the mural design. So as I mentioned before, the project got pushed back. And with that, uh, we presented our design in December rather than in October. 
The mural design included two messages, Black joy needs no permission and weaponize your privilege to save Black bodies. The first message placed a spotlight on Black joy, a radical act that exists in a context of anti-Blackness. And the second message highlighted that white people can use their privilege to support equity initiatives, dismantle unjust policies, and invest in institutional and structural changes. At the meeting, uh, we were specifically asked to discuss weaponize your privilege. We're told the use of weaponize detracted from the message of the mural and could be linked to violence. And we also were told some other suggestions for weaponize, including activate. And so Antoine Williams, one of the mural's brilliant artists, uh, thoroughly addressed these concerns and reminded members of the committee why weaponized was used and would continue to remain a part of the mural. After the concerns were voiced, uh, the decision was made for us to move forward on the condition that we had a committee survey and we had a committee dialogue that accounted for the word weaponized. And we moved forward with their suggestion uh, we did a survey, we shared a survey with community members, and we also had a, a forum in which we shared initial findings from that survey also. So based on the responses from the forum and the debate at the PAC meeting about the mural language, we decided when we returned to present the survey findings and our actions with the forum, we would also do some research about the historical and contemporary use of the language used in the mural. And so I took the lead on the research, uh, seeking out sources in academic journals, news articles that allowed me to investigate what does weaponize mean? How has the use of weaponized changed over time? And how is it used in our current discourse? At one point of my research, I ended up hitting a paywall for an academic article entitled Weaponization, Ubiquity and Metaphorical Meaningness by Dr. Gregor Matson from Oberlin College. I reached out and Dr. Matson stated that if my article can help uh, something so important as community arts, I am surprised and grateful. And I'm happy I reached out because this article ended up being a valuable source that helped me to trace the origin of the term weaponize and explore its transformation into a metaphor that became part of the broader cultural repertoire of contemporary journalists and writers. And so one important quote, I don't know if we can pull this up. Uh, I prepared a educational slide that I shared with the PAC meeting, but one important quote from his article that I used in this presentation at the PAC meeting was, in contemporary usage, weaponization, weaponized means the recent and illegitimate transformation of something into a weapon of thought for urgent and motivational public discourse and a heightened awareness about social issues. The presentation, the educational presentation that I did at the PAC meeting looking at language also talked about Black joy um, it reminded uh, the audience that Black joy existed within the wider context of white supremacy, state-sanctioned terrorism, and so if we should acknowledge it for the radical act that it is, um, and we should acknowledge it for the radical act that it is an ambition, a present, and a future where it is not stifled and certainly does not need any permission. And overall, my research into language used in the mural, I think, it expanded my understanding of the mural and its intended impact on our community. And it worked to also expand uh, members of the committee's understanding of the mural as well as share the information with community members also. And uh, that is my uh, contribution. And I'll turn it back to Jen. Um, thank you so much, Delissa. Um, so I don't know if Jason, if you can put the for all of our audience to see the link to that PS1 site. Are you able to do that? Okay. So there's a, there's still the page is still very available that has um, the results of all of um, the surveys that were done, and then toward the bottom, if you scroll down, are the slides that Delissa um, created. And one thing in our planning meeting for this conversation tonight is we all spoke about how 
well, yes, it is very common for artists and particularly muralists who are often doing historical um, work within what they're representing to do some kind of research that this kind of research on um, mm -hmm. kind of the words and the, and, and the meaning and, and going out into the community is relatively, relatively rare. And so that seems like a really exciting opportunity. Yes, yes. And it was, it was unexpected. And so I think that just speaks to what the mural or what the Oracle's project was overall, something that changed over time, that moved in different directions, that accommodated concerns, um, but still at the end of the day, maintained its core message and intention mm -hmm. for the community. I mean, it, it, the, the finished product is, my understanding, really looks like what Antoine and Dante originally, Dante Hayes, the other artist yes. uh, who did the original drawings. Okay. So, so then we will, um, we'll hear it then next from the person who actually helps to put this on that, um, on the wall. And so Jill, um, Jill is joining us tonight from Des Moines and um, I've only gotten to meet you Jill over Zoom, but it was such a pleasure. So I can't wait to hear. So Jill is going to um, help situate us to when this mural actually starts at what point, like all of our sense of time has become so you know fuzzy in the last two years. So when, when does, paint or you know when do you start actually working on the wall how long does it take and then you're going to share with us some of your own experience of of being the person who's out there every day in the public um creating this piece well thank you very much for that intro and for having me um i think both thomas and delissa did an amazing job and it I was kind of putting some of those pieces together as they were sharing. So as Thomas was talking about like this progression of public work and, you know, I live in Des Moines and uh, I just wonder, you know, what things would look like without having that public work exposure of all the, the works that came before oracles, um, you know, like what would that look like if that hadn't already been um, in the community of Iowa City? Um, I think that's really fascinating. And it's, I feel like I've experienced that to some degree where um, it really is what one of the primary reasons why I fell in love with oracles, because um, I've always kind of got the sense that um, I've, I've kind of been more on the censored end of, of I love public work and the public work I've done. Um, I, I feel like I've been very privileged. Um, my private practice though, and what I speak about there, I. It's, it's not as maybe as bold as, as um, you know, what, what I might like to do in a public space. And so that progression that Thomas was talking about and kind of like these introductions of these works and kind of getting that um, lead up, you know, to, to where, you know, the oracles came to fruition really is how I see that. And um, so I thought when really it was like February of um, last year, when I came across the, the call for the public work for Oracles, I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to have an opportunity to um, really be able to execute a work that talks about this ever again. So I jumped right on board and I answered the call for the public work. Uh, and then when Delissa was talking about the research, like a tremendous amount of research goes into um, works. And I, I just want to really like continue to underscore that because I get questions a lot about like, oh, how do you do this? Uh, you know, and um, it can take years of research, months, you know, until you get to the point where you, you execute the work. And I think that's important for people to understand. I think it's vital for the appreciation of the work, um, that it's not just this um, laissez-faire um, thing that gets put up, you know, for um, provoking thought or shock value. It's, it's much deeper than that. So as the lead painter, I was really contracted to work with Dante Hayes and Antoine Williams when it came to the like faithful execution of their, their designs. And I took that very seriously. And um, Thomas, I reached out to pretty much right away because um, 
the colors and the paint type, which was Nova, um, was one I hadn't worked with before. And so that was an amazing opportunity. And then, you know, kind of moving forward from that point, I got to meet the team. And I recommended Marissa Hernandez as uh, a fellow to help execute the work. And then uh, I think, Jason, we have some images that can kind of walk people through and just kind of introduce them to some people who might not be um, with us here right now, um, at least on the talk. But um, this is one of the, like the earlier stages. Uh, this image here that we're looking at is of Weaponize, that tower. Um, we used a boom lift for that. Um, I think Janice Maddock is on the uh, lift with me in this image. And we do the projections typically during the evening. So you can actually see um, under cover of night, you don't have to worry about uh, the glare of the sun that would drown out the projection of the image onto the wall. And then we can go to the next image. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So. Uh, we had some aerial drone shots, and this just really, I think, gives perspective of, you know, these public works, um, you have to um, use some different uh, equipment, oftentimes, than you would in a, a private piece that's maybe a little bit smaller. And so I just think this is a really cool image here of us. We're probably about 50 plus feet up in the air right now. Um, I'm sitting on the bottom of the basket and then Janice is, I think, painting one of the eyes of um, one of the oracles there. And then we can go to the next image. Yeah, um, Fred Ebong was the, um, one of the primary fellows who did documentation. So these shots are either um, his or um, John Brooks. So the, the two of them worked uh, together really, really well. They're a pleasure to work with in documenting the entire uh, uh, visual process, taking images, doing interviews. And so we switched out lifts. Um, we had some difficulties with the first one. Um, and so we ended up getting a scissor lift for uh, the completion of both the weaponize uh, tower and then uh, the joy. So I believe this is Marissa on the right, Marissa Hernandez, and then I'm in the center. And so sometimes you'll um, end up kind of overshooting the top of the wall. So this is 27 feet wide and um, 58 feet tall where joy is 68. And so if you need to um, work down, if you're rolling, um, then even though the height of the wall is one thing, you might have to go above and then work down, which is pretty cool experience too. And this is a ground shot as we're getting ready to kind of load up and we're still on the wall for weaponize. And um, that is Marissa Hernandez on the right and then I'm there in the center. And so Marissa, she is a very accomplished mural artist as well. She resides um, in Des Moines and you can find her work um, really on a couple of different social media platforms. She's amazing. Uh, we have Lois Arthur here. And it was an absolute pleasure to work with Lois. She's amazing. Um, and so this is the Joy Tower. And we were just kind of finishing up. I think this was our last day. And these um, kind of close up letters here um, are reading needs no. So Black Joy needs no permission. And I think this image here was taken actually by uh, John Engelbrecht. <laughs> so he and I got to work together too. So as much as like Thomas is talking and um, Delissa's speaking and all of us are kind of talking about these primary roles that we might've been contracted um, per se, like it was very much a team effort for everyone to work on multiple moving parts to execute you know, these towering um, public works. And I, I really feel like this opportunity for me went above and beyond you know, anything that um, was what I had done before and I may ever do again. It was 
absolutely tremendous experience that I can't quite put into words. And so working with the team um, through Public Space One and the Center for Afrofuture Studies um, is a huge part of executing as the lead painter. And then, you know, working with the community of Iowa City, my son got to travel with me and um, I got to hear a lot of feedback from, you know, individuals that would drive by. Um, some people loved it, hated it. Um, and kind of, I'm sure there's some people kind of in between there, but if I remember right, you know, Antoine uh, Williams talked about like that, that it's the, one of the primary um, conversations surrounding these, that it goes above and beyond a mural and that it's um, kind of evoking these uncomfortable conversations. And so then the, you know, the oracles are doing their job. Um, if things just remain status quo, then um, the question would be, you know, are we actually moving forward? Great, thank you so much, Jill. Jill, how how long from when you started till when you ended, um, you know, working at the actual site? Ooh, um, I believe it was just after March of last year, and no, it, I think it was April to August. I feel like, so I apologize about that. I, I, I got sucked into COVID land too there. For <laughs> um, Thomas but, might remember more clearly too. I don't yeah, know. and I don't track any of my hours. Yeah. I, I, I just show up and I do what needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a I lot was... of long days, a lot of long nights, but worth every, every, every moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for also for being so brave. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine. Um, so we're, we're going to shift in a, a slightly different direction. Um, so we invited um, Tracy Malloy to join us. And um, I, I got to know Tracy because she visited Iowa City a number of years ago for um, a seminar, um, a week-long seminar about um, public art. And uh, the, actually, John Engelbrecht from um, Public Space One helped to co-direct. And so Tracy, I would love, um, first of all, any reflections you're having at this point in the talk, and then um, providing some examples of your work as we then start to, as a group, explore um, kind of the public in public art um, for the, the next part of our conversation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for having me. And I'm thinking, so many thoughts as everyone's speaking. And I was really thinking about what Jill said at the end, which is how art can provoke conversation and sort of the, the role of art in all of this to stimulate dialogue and to maybe, you know, push, nudge people a little bit out of what they perceive to be their safe spaces. And so, you know, Thomas was talking in the beginning about how do you how do you build a community to prepare them for art? So to just go in and, and do a piece when there hasn't been a history of public art is sometimes a little bit trickier. Um, for contextual purposes, I'm gonna show a few pieces of, of my own work um, to help people uh, better understand maybe where I'm coming from. Um, so Jason, we can go ahead and pull up some images. As Jennifer mentioned, um, I came to Iowa City for the first time I believe it was either 2014 or 2015. And Thomas was talking about working with uh, United Action for Youth. And I also had the privilege of partnering with them. And uh, for those of you that are on the call that are from Iowa City, you can see Mickey Hampton in this photo and some of the young folks I worked with from UAY. Um, and so, uh, and John Engelbrecht, who was very instrumental in getting this project um, actually to live on a wall space. Uh, so this, this piece was up from, it's called I Am, I Will, I'm Afraid, Iowa City, and it went public in 2015. And I believe it was up um, either through 2016, or possibly into 2017. And one of the things that delighted me most um, about the project was after the space became a site for public art. So John was able to secure this wall and then someone else, this project went up afterwards. And so that to me was very exciting. So it wasn't just kind of a one and done piece. 
And this piece is a digital print on a vinyl banner. So it's designed to go up, function sort of as a mural and then come down. So it's not uh, permanent. And you know, there was conversation about that also in the beginning where murals can be temporary. And um, with a lot of my work, I really am interested in um, empowering folks that I collaborate with. So a lot of my collaborations are with um, adolescents or young adults. And many of the, the folks that I work with are trauma survivors. Um, in this particular instance, uh, the youth that I worked with, they were self-identified as outliers. And that's how they wanted to be contextualized when I talk about them as uh, partners. You're only seeing a, a smattering of the participants. And then just uh, for uh, knowledge, uh, the, the figure that you're seeing in the middle is a composite. So I photograph everyone. I sort of morph them together to create a prototype. And then all the text that is on the surface is handwritten by the participants. And they're, it's generated in response to three prompts. I am, I will, and I'm afraid. So they choose uh, what to write. Um, as a group, we often decide on which language um, is, or which lines of text will be present in the piece. Um, every step of the way, I consult with my co-collaborators. Um, so when the image is, is made, we chose the pose. Um, I don't remember what this place is called, but it was like a little tunnel and um, it had like light white, well, what is it, it called? It, I, I, don't, I don't think it has a name, but there was actually an earlier photo of Thomas painting in that exact same yes, space. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yes. yeah, going from the Ped Mall by the side of the hotel back toward what had been the mill. Um, I, I think Thomas was painting in that tunnel in a photo. I, I saw that picture and I thought so too. Yeah. It's not me, but that's okay. It's a, oh, it's, it's not a, you? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's your artist lovely. Name, artist named Drew Etienne. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this piece was up. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and then I'm just gonna show a couple other projects. Um, and then uh, this, this image in particular, um, this is now permanently installed uh, in the Bronx on the side of Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School. So having this image just above Fannie Lou's namesake is, is a tremendous honor. Um, however, this project, when it was initially installed in 2015, it was up for all of four hours and then it was taken down. And so um, it was immediately censored by the owner of the building. So this was a project that was made in partnership with the youth, with uh, high school students at Fannie Lou Hamer. It was made after the death of Michael Brown and Eric Garner. The students chose the language and the portraits, the silhouettes were also all taken of students that live in this particular part of the Bronx. And we wanted to have it on the front of the building because the building faces the Sheridan Expressway and you're, on average, you're, you're, you know, hundreds of thousands of cars are passing the Sheridan Expressway each day. So we wanted to call attention to the fact in this, we, I'm speaking of and recalling how the students spoke about the piece, that their lives do matter. They exist. Please see us. Do not just drive by the space and ignore us. Um, when the piece, and I don't want to get too much into the, the drama involving the takedown of the piece, um, spent a great deal of time trying to problem solve and get it, get it back up. Um, I will say that people in positions of power want to benefit, want to profit off of things. And when they don't profit, um, sometimes they will use their power to wreak havoc. Um, so excited that the piece went back up in 2020. It is now permanently installed. In the meantime, it was used as a backdrop for multiple events at the school, uh, in particular for what is known as the Peace Block Party. Um, so we had it used every summer um, for a huge community event and, and people would pose the banners themselves, the one that says Our Lives Matter is 12 by 15 feet and the smaller runners are four by eight feet. So people would post uh, in front of banners um, every, every year. I'm gonna share a couple more images and then I wanna make sure we have time to open up for a conversation. Uh, this piece is from a project I did in Portsmouth, Ohio, and I'm not sure if its companion piece is, is included as well. Um, this is from a series. Yes, thank you very much. 
Um, this is from a series called What It Means to Grow Up in Portsmouth. Uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, many consider to be one of the epicenters for the opiate crisis. Um, this project was permanently installed in 2018. Uh, it's very different to permanently install work versus knowing you're doing a piece that is going to be in the public, uh, but it is also temporary. You're also seeing composite photos. Uh, so the image here is uh, of a series of, of young women or cisgender women uh, from Portsmouth. And the background is the bridge that connects Ohio to Kentucky. So what you're seeing uh, behind are the mountains of Kentucky. Um, can we go back to the previous slide for a second? And then from the male point of view, you can see a little bit of the cantilever, the cabling of the bridge. Um, and the, the young men, uh, cisgender men, were standing in Kentucky with Portsmouth in the background. This bridge is um, when in 2013, when I first worked in Portsmouth, Ohio, um, the bridge was described as the center for drug trafficking. That's how the drugs got in and out of Ohio was going over this bridge. Um, the two adjacent text panels are composite or collective poems um, where each participant wrote their own individual poem. As a group, we voted on a line from the poem and then basically created um, their composite. Uh, this piece took uh, probably a year and a half to get installed um, due to censorship. So when the language was generated by the students, uh, folks on the ground, and this project was funded by the Ohio Arts Council, the Puffin Foundation, and universities um, helping to, to assist. Um, folks took umbrage to some of the language um, that then turned to taking umbrage with me not being from Ohio and maybe having an agenda. I did not write a word. I did not uh, generate any of the text. This is the, the youth, and they're reflecting on the experience. And one of the things that I think about a lot, and can I go ahead to, to, to the final piece I wanna share um, and talking about, thank you, um, art is the idea of shame. And so when you work with, when you collaborate sometimes and difficult work is generated, people on the, in the audience in the community sometimes have to reckon with, with the, the conversation and what's being generated and it hits buttons. Um, this piece here is made with, um, uh, sexual violence survivors from a university, uh, Ashland University in Ohio. And with the majority of my collaborative pieces, they're installed in public um, spaces, usually outdoors. And uh, this instance, the, the, my participants wanted to have it installed outside of the cafeteria. So it was something that would be encountered on a regular basis. Um, very similar to the uh, I am, I will, I'm afraid piece from Iowa City except in this context, everyone was speaking through the lens of being a survivor of sexual harassment and or sexual assault. Um, so that's where all the, the I am, I will, and I'm afraid text comes from. Uh, this piece, uh, the university, we went through every channel. We notified everyone every step of the way what was happening. Uh, we did a public forum. We staged an event. Um, all sorts of things. Again, very long story in association with this piece. Um, but the quick synopsis is after it was on display for three weeks, it was taken down by the university. Um, <laughs> and I was told that the custodian thought it was garbage. Uh, how can this be garbage? It had wall text, it had everything, um, but it was taken down before graduation. Um, there was immediate protest at that. Um, I eventually, was in conversation with university officials to find out, no, no, we want the language changed. We don't want this to be in association with anything from the university, um, lots, of, lots of stuff. Um, long story short, as this was all happening, Brock Turner, uh, his, his trial went live and the young woman who we now know as Chanel Miller um, spoke so eloquently in an anonymous letter about what it means to be a sexual violence survivor this led to a whole bunch of, of discourse at the university. The, uh, the piece ended up being reinstalled. Uh, the young woman who I was partnering with that was leading protests on campus was eventually given an award for exemplary leadership. And my personal victory in this was that I had asked that it be up all the way through first year orientation and be used as training um, about sexual assault awareness. And they, they did that. 
Um, but I, I want to uh, not tell more stories now because I want to be mindful of time and turn it over so we can discuss uh, about public art and maybe um, you know the difficulties that arise in, in having pieces go public. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you for just sharing your work. Um, I, I am very curious um, to get in a little bit to this question of who is the public in public art. And as you're conceiving um, a piece, um, you know, whether on your own or it seems that that's probably very rarely happening oh, in these large scale pieces. That's him. Yep, that's him. I'm now hooked. I'm going to keep going. Um, <laughs> you, anybody who knows the history of this cat is not surprised. Okay. Anyway, is um, how are you conceiving that who is the public and how is that maybe even shifting as you're working together on creating the piece and anybody who wants to jump in while I unhook myself. Um, I'll, I'll go. Oh, Jill, go ahead. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Well, so who is the public, I guess. So I would think about that when I'm doing research is, um, and anyone who has access to it through a number of different vehicles, um, whether that be, um, you know, sighted individuals who can see it online, um, in person, um, individuals who are maybe living with different levels of um, vision impairment who would have access to it via someone explaining it to them um, or being in conversation around the piece, um, all ages, um, all races, all genders. Like, so however someone would gain access to the piece, I would see them as public um, in public spaces. The difference I would have, um, I think, in going over that question would be if it's in somebody's home, there's restriction to access to who's going to enter the home. Um, so that public um, could be more curated, I guess, having experience to that work. So that's oftentimes for me how I, how I distinguish um, the answer to that question. And then I, I was going to jump in and, and think about when I do projects, I think about the audience and I think about my, I think my primary approach is often who am I partnering with and how do I empower someone to share their story, share their point of view um, and be mindful. I, I really appreciate what Jill's saying about what happens with someone who's cited versus not cited, uh, someone who is a child or a minor. So engaging in, in artwork that may be difficult. Uh, and then I also noticed there was a question in the chat about how do you circumvent uh, vandalism or what happens when you put a piece out in public and, and folks may, may be so uh, agitated by it, they want to deface it. And that's that's very difficult. And you know, um, I think about a project I did in, in Wisconsin with LGBTQ youth. And as a um, pre preemptive act, we installed the piece high, so high that no one could no one could graffiti it because there was fear that that might happen. And I really wanted I wanted no vandalism, of course. I also wanted the piece to be accessible so people could read it. So it's this, this you're treading a fine line because if the piece is vandalized, the pain that it has caused is, is that greater, which I think it can be, um, than, than putting the art out to begin with. Um, I'm yielding my, my conversation. I, I forgot to mute, but I'm done. Well, and I, to, to draw maybe Thomas and Delissa in, I, my understanding with this piece uh, with oracles is that there was some, uh, the awareness of, of Burlington street as a very ma major thoroughfare. And, and I think it was in something that you shared, Delissa, it might've even been your op-ed of it 
being a thoroughfare that tended toward um, um, a more white part of town in terms of who would be driving that on a daily basis. And so if there was, um, if as that team was putting that piece together, if they were thinking of, of who, who is our, our public, who is our intended audience, as, as Tracy's putting it in any of your conversations? Yeah, I would say that came up a lot in the conversation, and especially based on where the mural is. It's in downtown Iowa City. Uh, businesses are, are predominantly white owners. Iowa is a predominant. Iowa City is a predominantly white city. Um, when we look at the idea of progressive in Iowa, there's a lot that we need to unpack when it comes to racial disparities with who owns businesses, with economics, with education. And so those were part of the conversations that we were having. At the same time, while acknowledging this mural is not enough, which is something that came up repeatedly in our discussion. Yes, it is in Iowa City. Yes, it is talking about race. Yes, it is provoking discussion, but is it enough? Uh, we aim to supplement that with the, the mural, with educational program, with, with public program, with, with conversations, in some ways to compensate for the areas that we felt needed uh, a spotlight, um, to move conversations about the mural in different spaces in Iowa City, even though it was not necessarily positioned in those spaces. Um, but yes, the the location of the mural was was something that we we thought about a lot uh, while developing it. Yeah, I had even like joked with um, Professor Arthur, like when we were working on the logistics of executing them, I was like, you know, I, I knew, but I just kind of threw it out there. I was like, who chose this location anyway? Because it was such a feat. I mean, for me personally, there's a lot of things that were very challenging. So I was able to learn with the team on how to execute um, and, and learn what, you know, the space required. But it's such a fantastic space. I mean, it's you guys couldn't have done a better job, you know, and placing it in a location that it has and a tremendous impact, you know, it's like, sometimes I'll see murals that'll be tucked away somewhere. And I'm like, oh, if this was, you know, maybe it's like a little treasure or a little gem or a little jewel somewhere. And you don't see it till you like turn a corner and go into like a back alley or something like that. And you wonder like, what life would it have if it was in a different space? And so I think that it's, it, it's the oracles are where they're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great comment about this sort of scale and visibility of them because there are other murals in Iowa City that are really, really large. And, you know, you can, they're in alleys, so you can only see them from six feet away, like, you know, looking up like this. So um, I think kind of just to tie it into like the statements that I was giving at the very beginning, just to say about like, how is the space, how is the ecosystem of public art prime for a project like this? I think, you know, it's exciting for me that like one of the really biggest and most prominent murals is this one, that it isn't tucked away. So I think there are, there are nuances to the location and so on, but I'm also glad that, that this is the, the, the biggest and most prominent mural in, in town, other than maybe the UAOI one, which I think is also a great mural with great uh, lessons in it. The, the only last thing I'll say about location is just that um, you get what you get. Uh, and, and that's something that I tell a lot of people who are trying to like figure out where they wanna do a mural. And every wall has either, like Jill was talking about, big logistical challenges with executing them or permission related challenges or geographic challenges. Maybe it's not where you want it to be or whatever. And I think you just, with, a, with uh, projects like this, you try to find a, a sweet spot of all of those things. Where are the permissions easy? Where are the logistics easy? Where is the visibility most what you want it to be or, and so on. And you, you give different weights to those things and try to identify, identify the wall. So 
So I, I loved hearing everybody talk about this particular location and, and um, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad that it is what it is ultimately. Do you, and I'm very sorry to say that I think this is our last question because we're, we're at time and I want to be aware of that, but um, it may be too soon to say, but do you think that the Oracle's project has opened doors for other um, um, pieces? Uh, I can answer that, I guess, if I'm being very candid, I would say that right now I'm feeling like it's closed lots and lots of doors. I think that a lot of the people who hold the permissions to walls in Iowa City, uh, uh, not all, I want to be clear, not all, but there's certainly uh, people who say we don't want to be part of this kind of thing anymore. And that's, of course, not surprising in all kinds of ways. And, and I think what I hope is that, and actually I feel it's important to share that is that I know that that is not the feeling of a lot of other property owners in town. And so I hope that in knowing that, that, that some keys to some walls have been pulled back because of this project, that those other property owners step up and say, well, you know, I'm not afraid to provide a venue for a voice for my community. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. I think more than anything, seeing that a project like this is possible inspires the people who either hold the keys for permissions or the people who are going to make and develop the next project more than the few people who might be might be uh, stonewalling at this point, so. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I just wanna keep talking, but it is eight o'clock and um, I, I really want to thank all of you for uh, sharing your work and also for, for making this piece possible in our community. So um, thank you, each of you. And thank you, Jason, for uh, a more complicated than usual task tonight with the slides. So um, thank you all. Yep. And Sorry to this have is, failed on some slides. Oh, there. you're fine. <laughs> and this was recorded. And so we will, um, we will get it up as soon as we can. Yeah, and I'm gonna stop.